session is a bit of sort of a Singularity University 101 and hopes to sort of introduce you to some of the, the thinking that's uh, gone on in the program and, and, and some cross-currency and fields that are moving quickly, not necessarily directly in healthcare, but are certainly impacting them. So I can have my Prezi up. Um, let's sort of uh, take a quick purview of what we're gonna sort of look at in the, uh, in the next couple of, of days and some uh, touch points. So, um, so I was lucky to uh, do medical school at Stanford and then do my residency training in Boston in internal medicine and pediatrics. And I had a chance to go back to Boston, sort of a bit back to the future in a sense, uh, exactly two years ago. It was for the 200th anniversary of Mass General Hospital, a famous institution. That's 200 years is really old for those folks from Europe. Um, and had a reunion with the house staff that I trained with. These are the guys and girls that we were in the trenches with um, before we had these 80 hour work week restrictions in the United States for, for doctors these days. And it was a great chance to, to reunite to bond, to complain about Boston and walking uphill both ways in the, in the snow. Go Red Sox, any Red Sox fans here. Um, and after one of the receptions uh, at Mass General one night, I found myself, wandered upstairs and had all to myself one of the most famous spots of healthcare history, which is called the Ether Dome. And it's called the Ether Dome because in 1846, this is the very lucky, very first patient actually to get general anesthesia uh, with his surgery. Um, literally before that, they had to bite the bullet. And if you go back to the ether dome today, it's pretty much frozen in time. You can actually see the actual sponge that they had the ether in. Um, it must have been before the FDA. It's, uh, it's still there in the case. And um, it's frozen in time, a shrine to medical history. I wandered down the hall, literally three or four minutes away, in another part of Mass General, to the ward where I'd spent my first brand new month as a brand new intern in, in the mid-90s. And to my sort of shock and dismay, that hadn't really changed in almost 20 years. Um, some of the same alarms were beeping, some of the same nurses, Maybe some of the same patients, you know, had a little bit of PTSD maybe. And uh, the only difference was the poor young doctor was pushing around a cart with probably a 10 year old computer, had to print out the electronic medical record and put a paper version in the, in the chart. And they were still faxing orders back and forth to the pharmacy. I thought, you know, this isn't man's greatest hospital, woman's greatest hospital too. But, you know, healthcare in some ways is still being practiced like it's been since 1846, very much in silos, very much defined with old definitions. And, you know, we're now in this, as we'll be exploring, in this new world. It's no world of connected uh, medicine, digital age, genomics. We shouldn't be, you know, waiting in, in, nurse, in, in waiting rooms uh, for three hours or wait, you know, on average two weeks for a doctor's appointment as most Americans do today. And, you know, we have the opportunity to rethink and reimagine healthcare. That's what, that, that's what our program in Future Med and Singularity is about, is, is rethinking and reimagining and recreating the future, not just defined by the way we've done it, sort of by body parts and by allergies, but in new ways. And, and we're going to need new thinking for everyone in this room if we're going to address some of the huge challenges we have across healthcare, wherever you might be on the planet. And we could spend the entire day talking about all the challenges from, you know, in the U.S., 18% of our GDP, which dwarfs anything else. We have the aging demographic with many baby boomers and the aging population across the Western countries. You know, access to care, no matter what you think about politics and Obamacare, you know, even with uh, many folks covered, um, there's a huge shortage in the U.S. of, of primary care physicians and specialists in most parts of the country. We have a variety of clinical practice. We do things different at Stanford than at Mass General for the same exact case. Why is that? We're going to talk a lot in our session tomorrow on big data, and we're in this world of big data, but it's not necessarily actionable information. It's not often information that we can use, um, and there's a challenge in taking that fragmented information, that digital exhaust that we have, and our, everything from all the omics that are exploding and making that useful. And of course, in most clinical practices, uh, it's healthcare is still very fragmented. We waste about 30% of our healthcare dollar on inefficiencies and beyond. And while many of the technologies we'll talk about here um, these few days and many of the ones you're working on, are, many of them are actually here, we still have the challenges of the regulatory world, like here in the US, the FDA, which is not necessarily keeping up with technology trends, and our friends, the payers, and hopefully we have some payers here, because they need to start thinking differently about what's, what's paid for. Um, two meta trends that I think you're well aware of is that you know, we still spend most of our healthcare dollar on the right side of this uh, slide on the 20% of the sickest patients. In some cases, it's 50% of our healthcare dollar on the 5% of the patients. And that's because, you know, today we practice sick care, not necessarily healthcare. As a physician, we're incentivized to do procedures and biopsies and see patient after patient in most systems. And that's the way it's been set up for years, but that's starting to shift a bit to the left with these uh, new incentive-based models, outcome-based, accountable care organizations, and technology. And many of the folks here are developing those, are, are helping move that curve to the left so we can spend more of our time on prevention, understanding our own risks, and, um, and, and taking technology uh, in many ways to improve the curve and lower that cost curve as well. Another trend is where's healthcare happening? You know, it's traditionally in the hospital, the ICU. The pressures are to get folks out of the hospital faster and faster. 
into nursing homes, into their own homes, and technology can certainly play a major role in that, bringing technology you know, onto our everyday selves, onto our bodies, and beyond. Now, just to frame this a little bit, think, you know, I came back to Stanford for fellowships in hematology and oncology about 10, 12 years ago, and a lot's happened in the last 10 years. Think about how different, how almost magical the world will look today if you look back even 10 years. The things that we have available to us are, are pretty extraordinary, and you're gonna be hearing a lot from uh, the rest of our singularity faculty in this, in this session about the power of, of exponential trends versus linear thinking and how you know, exponential trends as epitomized by you know, Moore's Law and the power of the smartphone in your pockets is making everything you know, faster, smaller, cheaper sometimes, um, and, and beyond. And we have the opportunity to take technologies, not just you know, Moore's Law and, and, and computation, but to put them together. And so one of our main themes at Singularity U and FutureMed is, is convergence. How do we mash up technologies, particularly the ones that are getting faster, smarter, cheaper, and better, and use those to reinvent elements of healthcare? Just like we've reinvented all sorts of things. In the last 10 years, there's been major shifts and disruptions. You know, how we read is differently. Amazon sells more ebooks than regular books. We're seeing shifts, in, you know, anyone use Uber here, right? That's disrupting the taxi world, and it's almost delightful and fun. You know, someone's gonna build an Uber for healthcare, probably someone in this room, and that's gonna uh, be a game changer. Um, photography, you know, all these things. You know, when was the last time you went and rented a videotape? Or um, when was the last time uh, um, uh, you went to a travel agency? All these fields have been disrupted and are changing in, in dramatic ways, especially in the last decade. And there's the opportunity on the cusp of that in healthcare. You know, one area that's being disrupted and changing quickly is, is that of personal genomics. You're going to hear from Raymond McCauley later this session. I'm just curious, how many folks here have been sequenced or had any kind of personal genomics done? Okay, we have a select audience, so like 20%, 30%. Well now, you know, it's a pretty incredible time. And the fact that sequencing costs are dropping at twice the rate of Moore's Law. The fact that you can you now spit in a tube and get you know, 1.5 million base pairs analyzed for, for $99. The fact that you can even do some genomics on a USB stick. You know, that's changing the way we can access information ourselves. This is actually Raymond's uh, genome on a disk, and I wrote the prescription for him, so I've got the disk drive with his genome. But as a clinician today, he presents to me, I don't yet know what to do with all that information. We have the challenge of, putting that together and making it actionable and meaningful. So again, not just big data, but big, big information. And there's often a lot of ethical and, and uh, policy issues involved with that. Uh, if you've seen the movie Gattaca, you'll, you'll understand. So we have to think through some of those. We won't necessarily touch upon enough of those this week here, but a lot of implications to uh, personal genomics, personal data, and even longevity. Uh, we all want long um, health spans, and, and it's not just lifespan, as, as, as you know. Now, of course, it's not just genomics that's getting cheaper. We have the world of the proteome, we have environmental data. We'll hear from Bill Davenhall from ESRI on Wednesday thinking about environmental medicine and, and geomedicine. Um, the world of imaging is changing dramatically. Biomarkers, the microbiome, you know, uh, the fact that actually a singular university company called Ubiome is now making it available to, to sequence your gut pretty soon, and that's gonna be very impactful across spectrum. So lots of ohms are coming out. The trick is how do we put them together? Now with faster computing and Moore's Law, that's certainly impacting the world of, of imaging. Right, for the surgeon today, or the interventionalist, or the diagnostician, the ability to see inside our own bodies or those of our patients and really have high fidelity resolution, understanding you know, exactly where the tumor is, where the blood vessel might be to avoid. All those things are, you know, we used to take days, months, or weeks of, of crunching can now be accessible to us on our cheap smart tablets. So that's changing the way uh, we're understanding and diagnosing and treating. Um, in the world of neuroscience, and my good friend Mark Hodash is here, who uh, is the co-founder uh, of TedMed, which was run here. Uh, we got a TedMed two years ago, a chance to look in his own brain, and not just Mark's amazing anatomy, but now the connectome. And there's a lot of new initiatives to look at the brain mapping, not just of its anatomy, but it's the way it's built. We're gonna reverse engineering that to build new chips. And that's hopefully gonna change one of the major last bastions of, of, of misunderstanding the brain, not for, only for neuroscience, but for shooting psychiatric diseases and beyond. So a huge opportunity uh, in that realm. It's getting really exciting with, with some of the new imaging and other modalities. Many clinical fields are going to be disrupted. You know, we're seeing the world, you all know the world of the cardiac angiogram, the diagnostic angiogram, the needle, hour in the cath lab, a needle up the groin. Now, a 30 second CT scan can send their heart data to the cloud. This has been spin out from Stanford for HeartFlow. In 30 seconds of the scan, that data can be in the cloud. Five or 10 minutes later, they crunch the numbers and they can tell whether your coronary blood vessel is narrowed or not. The FFR, fractional flow reserve, used to be done with a needle uh, or the catheter and measured mechanically. Now it's done computationally. And they published in JAMA, it's about as good as the gold standard. So now you can be very objective. Does that patient really need a stent? And if so, what kind? Maybe you 3D print the stent as you need it, when you need it, as opposed to having uh, hundreds on the shelf that eventually get thrown out. So that's going to disrupt the world of the diagnostic cardiologist and beyond. We'll hear from Morpheus, uh, a company that I advise that has an incredible technology for 
probably disrupting the world of echocardiograms. So imaging, cloud-based data, the ability to access that on our mobile devices is pretty incredible. So it's no secret, I think, to most of us in the room here that you know, mobile and our smartphones are really becoming medical devices. You know, 10 years ago, we basically had a Palm Pilot, and that would be incredibly clunky today. If you had an iPhone 1, it'd be incredibly clunky today. Actually, my dad is here, he's an iPhone 3, he's waiting to get my iPhone 4, which I'm trading off. So if you had an iPhone 1, it would be old school, right? And today, you know, it's only been five years since iPhones came out, three years since tablets, and about 70 to 80% of US physicians bring their tablets to, to, to work with them. And every medical student at Stanford now gets their entire curriculum handed with them on a brand new iPad their first day of school. So the next generation of folks being educated and the digital natives are using this information differently, which has immense power to connect and enable our patients and us as clinicians and innovators. And in fact, you know, these are becoming, of course, ubiquitous. They're getting smaller and cheaper. You know, the, the lowest priced um, Android tablet on the market today in India is now $35. $35. You know, it's not the fastest Android tablet, but you can almost give it away. It could be part of your clinical trials. You could be giving it away to your patients for less than the price of a single prescription. So what are you gonna do when this $35 tablet is as good as today, this Galaxy, right? Which it will be in a few years. And it's democratizing healthcare you know, to, the, to the bottom billion on the planet, all who have SMS phones at the very least today. So huge implications there. And implications now to connect our technology. One of the themes, I think, of the empowered patient and the world of connected healthcare is now on our smartphones, we can directly measure our blood glucose as a diabetic and share that with our clinician and have a dashboard into our data and be able to meld that over time uh, to optimize uh, outcomes like hemoglobin uh, A1Cs, which you would measure. And that can even be done without connected devices, but just sometimes using gamification. So the patient records their blood sugar, it's, it's sent back to the primary care doctor, they can then tweak their insulin, the metformin, or the glucophage. And this study a couple years ago, they lowered the hemoglobin A1C by two percentage points. And that's a massive change. So when will we start prescribing apps with our drugs or apps instead of drugs? In some cases, you know, they can probably even do a better job. So we'll be prescribing things as you can already do today for, for pregnancy to pre-op and post-op care. So lots of innovation, obviously, in the mobile space. And ways to objectively measure diseases, things that used to be very intermittent and reactive, like how do you quantify someone's asthma? That can be done. We can tell where and when they're using their inhaler, right? And maybe a heat map and crowdsource some of that information. We're in the era now of, of again, gamification, adding new incentives to, um, because you know, we know behavior change is hard, sometimes, you know, maybe health bill instead of farm bill. Or we'll have a bill, um, Dr. Bill Crowns from Microsoft, and we'll see some new uh, Connect technology. This is low cost gaming technology. This is being hacked and utilized in all sorts of new ways in the world of physical therapy, for example. And you might have seen the new Leap technology, which is about this size and can measure micrometer movements in your fingers. All those things can be adapted uh, and are starting to be by a whole slew of innovators across healthcare. Um, and of course, it's not just digital data coming from our, our home devices and our vital signs, it's all sorts of information that's becoming digital, which gives us the opportunity then to touch it and have a dashboard. Some of that dashboard information is again coming from our mobile devices, from the ability to scan a skin lesion and determine whether it might be a cancerous or not, to do eye diagnostics, especially where there's not a good, a good number of optometrists or opticians. We'll hear from uh, Dr. Dave Albert uh, later this week, who's the inventor of the LiveCore EKG device, which has been a nice game changer both for physicians and patients and for screening to check your EKG right on your phone. So we'll get a chance to hear from him, as well as from the folks from Cellscope who are developing ways to look in your ears. All sorts of innovation is coming from mobile devices to give us data that we never had access to in the past. Many of you know this through a movement that started in the Bay Area, the Quantified Self Movement, which I think is now melding to become not quantified self, but quantified health, right? These technologies of which I'm wearing, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, oh, and one that tracks by posture, I can stand up straight back here, right? Is enabling us in new ways to, to get in touch with our own bodies, but increasingly to handle impress, you know, important medical issues like hypertension, you know? One in three uh, Americans has high blood pressure, yet one in, but half of them don't have it well controlled. So now there's $8 connected blood pressure cups. You could buy one in an Apple store or a Best Buy today or online. You know, we don't need to wait for the payers to pay for this. You can start challenging your patients and, and bar lending them these to get them on tune. So lots of opportunities in that realm. So I think we're gonna have a new set of tools, both as clinicians, healthcare systems, and as patients. Um, we'll, we'll be hearing from, uh, a medical student from Hopkins tomorrow about smartphone physical, and you'll be able to do a smartphone physical in the demo room, which is a whole new set of tools, some some of all for a while, some very brand new ones that you only see here, which are gonna be game changers in how we can do uh, 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 diagnostic exams on ourselves as non-clinicians, but also enhance our exams anywhere on the planet. 
We're in the world of epidermal electronics now. MC10 has conformal electronics. They're now in a new helmet to track uh, kids who are getting concussions playing, playing football and beyond. We're seeing connected diapers, you know? It's not science fiction anymore. Huggies has Tweet Pee that just came out. There's other types of connected diapers uh, that can be fun. Um, we have dashboards for our own data now. They're getting very low cost and inexpensive. A startup out of the Valley uh, called VitaConnect has a $2 patch. I'm actually wearing one right now. If you can switch over to my live vital stream, it's talking to my phone. Um, I'll see if my live demo works. There we go. Oh, there's my live EKG. Oh boy, any cardiologists here? Uh, Heart rate's only 127. My stress is only 99%. That's good. And as I, you know, as I move around, it'll track my steps. It'll know my posture and I'm going to stand up straight. If I fall down, it'll know after a little while that I've fallen down. If I haven't gotten up, it could call 911. And again, this is a lot of data. If, if, if you're my physician, you're not going to want to see all of this all the time. So we need smart filters on this. But it's an example of low-cost technology that can be very helpful. About, like a heart patient who's being discharged from the hospital uh, can be monitored. To prevent readmissions. Yeah, let's switch back. It's getting scary looking. Thanks. Back to slides. Um, so the trick will be leverage, use that data in, in, in smart and national ways. And it's not just vital signs, obviously. Laboratory on a chip. You know, it used to be hundreds of dollars had to be shipped across the country. The world can now be done on uh, chips at the point of care, often with a microliter of blood. So the whole world of diagnostics is being disrupted, both on the genomic side, the point that you can even print out some laboratory exams and analyze those with, a, with your camera on your smartphone is changing the game. So again, the idea is a digital checkup can happen almost anywhere, uh, both in the world of telemedicine, uh, connectivity, uh, home-based diagnostics, and lab laboratories is going to be, I think, very interesting. And again, it's no one piece of technology, it's the layering of these as they converge. For example, you know, on the eye pill that was developed by Philips, initially in Israel, you know, here's one, it's this big, it's the convergence of all sorts of technologies that you can now swallow and it will replace a normal upper GI and can tell, you know, maybe if you have gastritis or an ulcer and in some cases even release drugs. So it's a super convergence uh, that makes some of these things possible. We have more and more connected devices, you know, the new pacemakers all have IP addresses and you might have heard about Dick Cheney who had his turned off the connectivity so he wouldn't get hacked by a terrorist. It might have been a good thing. But, you know, uh, so there's the idea that you might have your own implanted devices, you know, hacked. That's possible. Uh, so it's always a dark side. There's also the question of who owns the data. Uh, our friend Hugo here is an implantable AICD, the company that makes it. Won't give him his actual own data. Who owns this? Maybe we could share our information in even more powerful ways. Too much information. You know, whether patients, physicians, payers, we're now in this era of immersive data but it's hard to keep up. You know, the average US physician at least only reads three or four hours of journals a month. How can we keep up on all this information and make, make it smart? Well, one element we'll hear about next from Neil, Neil Jacobstein is, is artificial intelligence and AI. A lot of that work has been promulgated in healthcare from Watson. And we'll meet Marty Cohn from IBM Watson tomorrow on, an, on a panel on AI and big data. And I think a lot of physicians are threatened by AI, so I've turned it around and called IA, intelligence augmentation. which I think it's what it's meant to do, not necessarily replace us yet. But it's going to replace some functions in healthcare and make things hopefully smarter and more efficient. And uh, you know, I don't think the robot's going to see you too soon in most settings. But today, it's already happening. In fact, you know, story in the Wall Street Journal from uh, September, J and J came out with a robo anesthesiologist to do this, the basic anesthesia during uh, during uh, endoscopies. Uh, so uh, of course, the anesthesiologists are fighting this like like crazy. But disruption's happening. And this might do a better job than the anesthesiologist reading the paper during your case, right? So. Where does this come together? You know, um, companies that have come out of, out of FutureMed, like Jointly and others, are looking at how do we pull data information together. And just like your car, you know more about the health of your car than your own body in many cases, we can pull that together and hopefully have the equivalent of our own check engine light, our own OnStar for the body. Um, because I don't want to log into addresses and apps for all these devices. We want them, the, the information, the actual information, to come to you. And each of you is going to have a different check engine light setting than I will, for example. So lots of opportunity in that regard. Now, I know we have some Trekkies here, uh, and you know a lot of these things from the past are becoming today's reality. You'll see Movisante and other low-cost ultrasounds in our, in our demo room. And that has inspired you know, a new XPRIZE. We'll hear from our Singularity co-founder, Peter Diamandis, later this session. The XPRIZE and all this ways to change incentive models is bringing all sorts of new folks together, from building new sensors to uh, whole new elements. And we've seen companies, one of the companies that you'll meet, uh, the, the the CEO this evening, Walter Brower, founded um, um, Scanadu, and they started essentially at the first FutureMed in 2011. And very, very quickly, they've been work building, working prototypes. We have the, the chief medical officer, Dr. Alan Green, here as well. Um, so hopefully, you get a chance to try these later. But imagine having the power of 
what might just be a digital thermometer at home, now in your hand, and the ability to put that together in smart, powerful ways, including ways to do point of care, you know, urinalysis, and influenza testing. And this is technology they built within a couple of years, and they were hopefully inspired a lot by their first experience with FutureMed. And we actually introduced Scanner to, to a design firm called IDEO, out of the design school at Stanford, because it's not enough to have the technology, it needs to be integrated together. So this is a peak of where this might be in a couple of years if we're smart about integrating it together. Take a look. Some of you have seen this before, but it's a good lesson in what's coming. We need the sound up. But on a day to day basis, we're still in the dark about our own health. We are changing that. What if instead of fearing the worst when you notice something out of the ordinary, you could identify the condition yourself? Getting the right diagnosis would save you worry. Is this a crisis? And an unnecessary doctor's visit. Instead of hearing about a viral outbreak in the news, imagine you got an alert that was tailored to your family's needs. It would also give you advice about what to do next. What if you had a way to identify what was wrong right away? A way to get all of the information you need to understand the situation. Serious cases, you would know when and where to see up. We're building a way for people to check their bodies as often as they check their email. It's all awesome, and it's only the beginning. So, the average person checks their cell phone like 150 times a day, so hypochondriacs are going to be in trouble. But this is going to change the way we do connected health, right? We can have information going back and forth in new and powerful ways. And of course, the social network is incredibly important in that realm as well. And that can be leveraged to change ma major behaviors. We'll hear from, uh, from uh, because we know our behaviors are more impactful actually than our genetics and our health outcomes. And often if you put folks together, as Sean Duffy, one of our future med alums, has done with his company Omado, we'll hear from him on, on, on Tuesday, you can powerfully change the course of, let's say, folks who are gonna become diabetic and shift their path. So putting information together and letting people see that data differently, if you're trying to change your, your eating habits and you, you see your virtual self in the mirror and you can see healthy you, you know, that might really change your, your, uh, your incentives, right? Or you see what happens if you keep eating donuts every morning for breakfast, right? And, and you don't need to wait for the magic mirror, by the way. You know, you can download apps. This is me before and after 500 donuts, you know. That kind of changed my wiring a little bit, right? Well, what happens if you or your kid's spending too much time on Facebook, right? Things can, can be uh, changed by, by, by seeing things differently. Including, you know, if I'm counseling a, a young patient about smoking and I can show what she's going to look like if she keeps smoking with her own actual physique, that can be very impactful in, 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 in uh, changing behavior. Um, we now have the world of telepresence. You met the amazing beam robots here. You'll have a chance to drive those and interact with those. We're seeing other ones that are built specifically for healthcare and interacting. Robotics is becoming important in the operating room. We'll hear from Dr. Catherine Moore from Intuitive Surgical and others uh, about the robotics field. Um, and robotics is changing the way we're enabling the disabled. I had the chance, we have a whole great, amazing contingent from, from the Netherlands. I was able to visit Het Dorp last year, and they're using robotics in amazing ways on wheelchairs and beyond. And now in the world of brain computer interface, we can connect, in this case, a quadriplegic who hasn't moved in 16 years, and just by thought alone, you know, give herself her first drink of, of coffee in, in 16 years. So we're starting to super enable the disabled in many powerful ways. And we're connecting the brain in other ways beyond. You don't have to have a chip on the brain. We're now in the world of brain computer interface, PCI, that you'll have a chance to try here this these few days as well. We'll hear from Ariel Garten and others who are making commercial versions of these devices to enable us to interact with our environments. And for those who don't need a robotic prosthetic arm, who are muscle weakness of stroke, we're now emerging into the world of exoskeletons that'll help, I think, change the game for many of us as well. So of course, with something like a spinal cord injury that might require an exoskeleton, we actually want to cure that. So we'll touch upon the world of regenerative medicine on Tuesday with Bob Harari and, and myself. We'll think about the gentleman on my left there won the Nobel Prize last year for developing induced pluripotent stem cells. It really to almost take a skin cell and reprogram that for any of us to make our own embryonic stem cell lines. And now merging that with the world of, of 3D printing. And we'll hear from Avi, one of our faculty later in the session, about the world of 3D printing, which is just exploding. There's going to be very 
disruptive and challenging across many spheres uh, is being leveraged in orthopedics and beyond. Um, you'll, be a, you'll get a chance to have yourself scanned like I have. I have a little mini me in my pocket. You'll get to make a mini me hopefully here. And, and that's not just, you know, uh, for fun. It, it might impact folks who are, are missing part of their face from cancer. Um, that's going to blend with bionics. Lots of things are, are coming together. Uh, we're seeing basic organs being done and downstream maybe we'll make more complex ones. Now, of course, it's not just technology for technology's sake. Sometimes we need to figure out again who pays for it. Dr. Dean Ornish will be giving a keynote tomorrow evening, and he likes to say, you know, we don't practice evidence-based medicine, we practice reimbursement-based medicine. So it's often really important to align some of these crazy misincentives and disincentives that we have, and to take some of the technologies that used to be, you know, magical 10 years ago and implement them in new ways. And that's part of the theme of Singularity University is bringing folks together from different realms. We have our 10-week summer programs and executive programs. Um, you'll meet Peter and Ray. We look at uh, addressing global challenges, including those uh, in healthcare. And one of our startup companies and ideas that came out of a program two summers ago is called the Matternet. They're thinking about how to use drones. Low-cost drones today could not just be used by the CIA or deliver your, 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 your taco. It's going to be used for healthcare. So they've developed drones, sort of like this one, that keep getting faster and cheaper and can live stream the room, for God's sakes. And I can control it with my eye, and here we go. And these can eventually deliver drugs and vaccines uh, in places of the world that have poor transportation. So we'll see lots of innovation using technology you may not have associated with healthcare. Maybe you have a crash and your OnStar in your car uh, knows where you are and sends you a rescue bot to drop off a, a package for first responders or to deliver AICD uh, defibrillators or beyond. So a lot of innovation coming from that space. Thank you, Marco. And you'll get a chance to hopefully fly that later this week. Back to my slides. So that's one idea. A Harvard medical student came to one of our programs developed a telepresence glove to enable better diagnostics. Um, and again, at Future Men, the whole idea here is to, to mash us all up and think in new and powerful ways. And, it, and it's new players, right? I think many of you folks here are not traditionally in healthcare. And it's applying your skills and thinking in new ways that can make big impacts. Even Google, as you may have heard, is now making a major play into thinking differently about longevity uh, and aging. Right? So a whole new realm of big open data, new startups like Rock Health, some of the rock health companies will be here and others are re letting us to think differently, including the design world, right? It's not just about having the technology, it's about putting together in smart and powerful ways. All the way from, you know, when I fly back to San Francisco, I'm not gonna put wings in the car. Ideally, I'll, I'll fly in a jet or beyond. And I've had a background in aviation as a pilot since uh, college. And, you know, I learned to fly in Cessnas, but later when I was uh, a freshman, uh, sorry, a resident of Mass General, I joined the Air National Guard. So I always wanted to fly in fighter jets and had a chance to be a flight surgeon be the doctor for the pilots. And there's a lot to learn from aviation and from military medicine and beyond that we can apply to healthcare. So it's an element of design thinking. So for example, in aviation, flying has gotten much safer through the world of checklists, right? Checklists have made flying much safer. Now it's being applied in the operating room. Many of you have read Atul Gawande's book uh, on uh, the checklist manifesto, 30% reduction in mortality and costs. So that's being applied and it's being amplified. We have the world of simulation. You'll have some amazing simulation demos uh, in the demo room and beyond. And we're applying simulation in new ways, not just to train pilots, but to train surgeons and medical students and beyond. And we're doing entire teams now. You have a, we have a sim center at Stanford now where you can, instead of see one, do one, teach one, it's see one, sim one, sim one until you get it, get it right, right? We're in the world of heads-up displays. We're now have taken our, our round you know, steam dials and now they're, they're glass dials. And even you know, the fighter pilot com the companies that make fighter jets, like Lockheed Martin is helping Hopkins design their next generation uh, intensive care units. So we have dashboards and information that makes sense to us. We need different information if we're you know, landing in bad weather, and sometimes we need a warning from, from what's called bitching Bob. He'll kind of tell you to pull up if you're about to hit a mountain. Or you need different information if you're in a dogfight. And now that's coming to healthcare. We're in the world now where we see information, just like when we drive, that can impact our care. What if we have a healthcare GPS? You know, Daniel, go right to the gym, not left to McDonald's, right? If you have your own personal GPS, it knows you. And isn't overwhelming, right? And too much information to challenge. And we're seeing that happen now in healthcare. It's not just from the idea of assisted living contact lenses that could port the internet to your eyeballs. We're now in the era of, of Google Glass and beyond, right? And here's just an example of an app that you might imagine on the dark side. You know, you wear it out on a date and uh, it's a challenging date, so maybe you bring up the Wingman app and that gives you a little extra situational awareness. And uh, there we go, not a bad date. But that's, you know, the dark side. But we're gonna use this information in all sorts of powerful ways. And you're gonna see folks here with Google Glass who are doing some amazing innovations on that. We have the the head of the Google Glass project from Glass FutureMed, 
And a lot's happened just in the few months since these have been sort of in alpha launch. So we'll see our environment differently as patients, as physicians. You'll see your breakfast maybe differently in the morning, and maybe you'll get another, you know, before and after sort of a different warning system as you go. Right? So, you know, Finally, you know, we're starting to enter the world of radar. You know, when we're starting, we'll talk about electronic medical records with John Matson and, and uh, Christopher uh, Longhurst from Stanford tomorrow. You know, what if we start to see data from our EMRs and know where other patients are, patients like ours, patients like, like me, you know? Uh, we'll have the founder of patients like me speaking on Wednesday, Jamie Haywood, so we can start to crowdsource clinical trials and put data information together. Just like when we drive on the road with like, the Waze app on Google Maps, you share your privacy a bit. Where are you going? What's your speed? Now you can build a map of Rome in a day. Build Rome in a day just on the driving information so you can get to work faster, avoid the speed traps and beyond. So what if we could apply that thinking to healthcare and beyond? So in summary, you know, it's sort of a theme and a setup for this next few days. In many ways, we've been flying blind in healthcare. We have a lot of new tools at our disposal. We have new ways of thinking, all the way from geomedicine and using things like Google searches to know what's happening exactly in our neighborhood, for example, flu trends and influenza. We can start leveraging the social network in new ways to know, you know who to interact with or not to interact with in, in certain cases, right? Um, we're going to start seeing ways to have dashboards and draw information across the spectrum. We can think systems and integration and gaming and mobile and apply design thinking and hopefully enter a realm where we're shifting healthcare from something that's been traditionally very episodic and reactive to something that's really much more continuous and proactive with all these new sensors and information at our disposal. So it's a brave new world. I think we all need to work at changing the thinking. You know, we're not just blood and organ donors, maybe we can even be data donors. We're gonna change my world of oncology. Personalized oncology is coming where we sequence every tumor. We're moving to all sorts of incredible realms as we move downstream. So that's the, 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 the power and the challenge that we have uh, here at Future Med in the next few days. And I think you know, it's evident that you know, a lot of technologies, like my Google Glass, in many ways the future's already here. You can take a picture and a video if you want. It's just not evenly distributed. But as Peter DeMandis likes to say, if you don't just, just you know, predict that future, we all have that amazing opportunity to go out there and create it. So with that, I'll say thanks again. Welcome to Future Men. We're off for a great few days. Thanks.